speaking of witnesses of explosions, one of the witnesses was the Lamont Doherty Earth Energy Observatory, 20 miles north. And so these signals, seismic signals, were received. And FEMA and NIST relied on this report that was put out by them. So we have the first plane impact, and there are seismic signals that are received at about the time of that impact. So NIST and FEMA attributes those signals, signal spikes, to those very plain impacts. And that's true also for the South Tower, which produced a 0.7 magnitude seismic spike. Uh, but is that true? Are they due to the plain impacts? Well, the event happens at 846 and 26 seconds. But the plane impacts don't happen until 846 and 40 seconds, according to the NTSB radar that the 9-11 Commission relied on. That's 14 seconds later. So what could be causing those initial impacts if it's not the planes? Um, and NIST claims that the, the plane impacts actually occurred 10 seconds earlier. That accounts for uh, a good portion of that. But uh, they actually then go, they still, they're still short four seconds. So they go, NIST goes back and privately contracts with Columbia University, who runs the LDEO, in 2005 to get them to reinterpret their data. And they do. And they move back the entire seismic spike three seconds, much closer to the NIST's unfounded plane impact time. So uh, that's the kind of signs that we're working with here. Actually, it happens in the South Tower event also, where we have the seismic spike occurring at 9.02 and 54 seconds, but the plane impacts, according to NTSB radar in the 9.11 Commission report, only occur 9.03, 11 seconds. That's 17 seconds later. How are we going to resolve this? Well, NIST comes up with 12 seconds uh, right, right off the bat, uh, using a series of uh, justifications relying on videos in a very complex calculation, but they're still short five seconds. So what do they do? Again, in the same contract, they move the whole seismic spike back or get the uh, LDEO, Columbia University Professor Kim, to move back this seismic spike uh, three seconds, which helps them within their margin of error. Wow. Well, what else could be responsible? if it wasn't the airplane impacts. Mike Pecoro is, uh, is a witness. He says, the whole building seemed to shake. There was a loud explosion. When the two arrived at the sea level, that's three stories down in the basement, they found the machine shop gone. There was nothing there but rubble. We're talking about a 50-ton hydraulic press, gone. They made their way to the parking garage, but found that it too was gone. There were no walls and there was rubble on the floor. You couldn't see anything. The steel and concrete fire door weighed 300 pounds, wrinkled up like a piece of a foil lying on the ground. There's other witnesses of explosions in the basement prior to the plane impacts. Let's listen to Willie Rodriguez. It was a janitor, like I said, on that day, there was an explosion on the basement, and uh, this is prior to the building got hit by the plane, and then the plane hit. I think a bomb went off the lobby first, then a plane hit the building. The bomb hit the lobby first. In a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. So bombs hitting the lobby, the basement, prior to the planes hitting. Lots of witnesses uh, 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 corroborating this, but also applied geophysicist Andre Rousseau says the frequency of the Raleigh waves attributed by the LDEO to the plane impacts were on the order of only one hertz. That's a very low frequency, but aircraft crash impacts have much higher frequencies, 10 hertz, often up to 100 hertz. That's two orders of magnitude higher than what was recorded. And yet they're attributed by the LDEO to the plane impacts. Not only that, but these frequencies, these higher frequencies are actually filtered out 
by the bandpass filter used by LDEO, which only accepts frequencies 0.6 to 5 hertz. Rousseau says the range of the instruments cited by LDEO does not allow for the recording of such waves uh, uh, by crash impacts. The seismic equipment is designed to detect seismic events like earthquakes and explosions around one hertz. This is very important. So he says the, the actual waves generated by the crash had to have been deadened before hitting the ground. I mean, they're th uh, more than a thousand feet up in the air. It's basically hitting a flagpole, right? And so uh, that couldn't have been the case. But how about um, the actual collapses? Though those there were seismic spikes associated with the time of the collapses as well. In the case of the South Tower, we're talking about a 2.1 magnitude uh, event. And in the case of the North Tower, we're talking about a 2.3 magnitude event. Now, in each of these cases, FEMA and NIST are associating the seismic spikes with the debris hitting the ground. Can that be the truth? Let's look. We have nearly identical collapses, and yet the seismic strengths are quite different. 2.1 in the South Tower versus 2.3 in the North Tower. That doesn't seem like a big difference, but guess what? Uh, it's on a logarithmic scale. It's 1.6 times greater in the North Tower. So. We can't. We we have the same debris hitting the ground in each case. Same style of collapse, or in this case, demolition. So it can't be responsible for 1.6 times the energy. Andre Rousseau says identical buildings and nearly identical collapses can't possibly produce seismic events of extreme different energy releases on an order of magnitude. Well. Uh, we also have the concrete floors, floor trusses, gypsum board walls, and the building contents pulverized to dust. So there's no seismic component in the concrete floors because they were pulverized, as we saw in midair. There's no seismic component, or extremely little, from the steel frame because it's shattered to individual wall units, as we saw, four to eight tons each. And they don't hit the ground all at once, but over a period of 12 to 15 seconds. And they don't hit the ground, most of them at all. They hit a seven-story concrete basement structure. So that's further deadened. They're equally distributed also over the entire World Trade Center super block. Uh, it's not a focused crash. It is a series of pelting of four-ton objects, which can't produce this, this 2.3 magnitude quake in the North Tower, 2.1 in the South Tower. So we have the seismic spikes in, in our effort to try to find what could have produced these spikes if it wasn't the debris hitting the ground. They start at 959.04. This is per the original LDEO analysis, the report that came out that it has been made public. Um, the start of the tower's collapse is at 958.59. Uh, according to NIST, uh, that's five seconds earlier. So the debris can't hit the ground in five seconds, so we have a problem, right? The debris starts striking the ground 12 seconds after the start of the collapse. So what's providing this initial spike? Well, once again, for the collapses, NIST goes to L uh, Columbia University and gets them to move this seismic spike back three seconds as well. So that's that's not science. That's uh, rigging your data. So what can be what responsible for these earlier seismic spikes? Uh, let's take a look at the work of Graham McQueen in 2009. Did the Earth shake before the South Tower hit the ground? Well, he looks at a tripod-mounted camera in this case, which shakes seconds before the collapse of World Trade Center 2. Let's watch. We're going to see the camera shake there, and three seconds later, 
the building collapses. So these are tripod mounted, and you say, well, maybe somebody kicked it. But this is corroborated uh, by other uh, uh, est est uh, testimonies as well. In the case of the North Tower, we have the seismic spike, st seismic spike starting at 10, 28, and 31 seconds per the original LDEO report. And tower doesn't, the tower starts its descent at 10, 28, and 31 seconds, nine seconds earlier. But the, the, once again, the debris can't hit the ground in nine seconds. So what's, what's happening here? It, do, it doesn't hit the ground until 12 seconds later, 10, 11, 12. Uh, and at 10, 28, the heaviest debris hits the ground. Uh, so we, we have a few problems here. Uh, that's four seconds. Here's the main problem, though. There are very clearly defined P waves, a P wave and an S wave that arrive at the seismology, seismology, seismic instruments uh, well before uh, uh, the, the event starts. In fact, even before the tower starts descending, uh, these P waves and S waves are effectively ignored by LDEO, curiously enough, they actually show them, but they 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 mention that they're indistinguish, indistinguishable from background noise. But as you see in their graph, they are not indistinguishable, indistinguishable, indistinguishable at all. So uh, NIST has a time problem, right? So the, again, in the same contract in 2005, which report remains unpublished, they move back the seismic event, three more seconds, closer in line with their heaviest debris striking the pavement at 1028 and 36, 36 seconds. This is cooking the books. It's a big problem. Uh, so what could produce these P waves and these S waves? Well, once again, the work of Graham McQueen shows that there's shakes six and 10 seconds earlier than when the tower starts to set. This one's more obvious. Uh, take a look at this one. We're going to see there's the big shake. And in this case, six seconds, building comes down. So this happens again and again and again. And in the case of the Etienne Sarre film, we have this third tripod mounted camera shaking, corroborating with eyewitness accounts. And shake is coming up here very clearly. And then just like I said, like a train running under my feet, the firefighters. And then 10 seconds, we have the beginning of the collapse. So some people have suggested, well, 2.3 is not enough magnitude. Look at the Seattle Kingdom. It was only four or six stories tall, and it produced a 2.3 magnitude. Well, this is not apples and oranges, folks. Um, here's a 25,000 ton concrete roof, which falls and impacts the ground all at once. Very different from four ton structural steel sections pelting the ground over a period of 15 seconds. It's not the same. And so one of the beautiful summaries of this evidence is in the consensus 9-11 work. David Ray Griffin, Elizabeth Woodworth, um, and others have put their hearts into finding the best evidence. Well, point TT7, why did the Twin Towers collapse? The seismic evidence uh, puts all of this together quite well. And they rely heavily on the Andre Rousseau article of 2012, where explosives the source of seismic signals emitted from the New York on 9-11. And Graham McQueen's, did the earth shake before the South Tower hit the ground? 2009. There are also other excellent works, seismic proof, 9-11 was an inside job. Craig Furlong and Gordon Ross.